Welcome to Your Family Dog, a podcast dedicated to helping families love living with dogs. Hi, and welcome back back to Your Family Dog podcast. I'm Julie Fudge-Smith, and I'm here with Tina Spring, and we have a terrific guest this time. His name is Mark Kyle, and the reason we wanted to bring him on is because his company does some amazing things for helping our dogs overcome a wide variety of illnesses. And what his company, PrEP, which is Stem Cells for Pets, what they do is They harvest the stem cells and the platelets, and they regenerate. um, Well, I'm not going to, I can't describe it nearly (laughs) as well as I can, but basically what they do is they use your dog's stem cells to help treat various illnesses in your dogs, including cancer. Is that correct, Mark? Not cancer, but everything else. Okay. Okay. So you want to tell us a little bit about what this this, uh, therapy is and how it works and who's eligible for it? Absolutely. First off, thanks for letting me join you guys. I'm excited to, to meet both of you. Um, I've done a little bit of research on both of you guys too. Tina, by the way, I just wanted to tell you, you're a big motorsport person. I actually used to race cars down in Baja, so the Baja 500,000. So there's a lot of motorcycle guys. So I figured you'd get a kick out of that. That's awesome. Yes. <laughs> I'll have to hear stories off the podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, the company, um, if you go to our website, it's prepvet, P-R-E-P-Vet.com. And basically what PREP is, that it's an acronym, and I'm going to get into all the specifics. It's an acronym that stands for platelet-rich enhanced with stem cells plasma. So P-R-E-P, platelet-rich enhanced stem cells with plasma. So let me kind of give you a little bit of background of what that is. So let's start with PRP. PRP is an acronym for platelet-rich plasma. And basically what that means is, is your body has a, an abundance of platelets, but this makes it when you, when you harvest blood, we get our stem cells and um, uh, the um, platelets from plasma. When you harvest them, we actually concentrate it, which is anywhere from eight to 16 times more than what you normally have. So what a platelet is, though, it's not a cell. Think of it as a water balloon. And basically in that water balloon, there's about 35 different proteins in there. And one of the big proteins in there is actually anti-inflammatories. And they're all, they're, the other ones are all healing factors. So I, in the human world, we hear about it all the time. As a matter of fact, a lot of my friends and women in particular now, when they're going in, they're actually getting platelet uh, PRP injected into their face to get rid of wrinkles in that too. And they're using it for hair replacement and a, 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 an abundance of other things. But the big thing for it is, is really anti-inflammation. So when you and I and our dogs, and you know, I always tell people when I'm talking about dogs have the same things we have. So when you're looking at your aches and pains, they're having the same things. You just can't communicate the same way that we can. But anytime you have anything that's generally wrong, regardless of what it is, there's, there's inflammation involved. So what we do is we actually get we get our stem cells from blood, and I'll talk about some other technologies out there as well. And then we we isolate, we get plasma from that, and then we get these uh, this, the the uh, the platelets, and we concentrate them to a high um, a high percentage so we can really take take care of some of that stuff. But let's let's talk a little bit about the history of stem cells, and we'll get into what I do. First off, for you guys that were um, older um, than five or six in the 1980s, there was a big deal about embryonic stem cells. We all heard about it in the news so for us that were growing up there. And it became this big deal. And um, it ended up become people were concerned that we were, they were getting stem cells from embryos. That's not the case, but it became a big religious issue. And there was all kinds of things against it. Then if you fast forward into the early 2000s, there was a guy by the last name of Yamanaka who got the Nobel Peace Prize for doing studies with what they call induced pluripotent stem cells. Basically, what he was doing, he was taking these cells and inducing them to be something like skin. And that the, the study he did was with skin. Now, everything in our body has a stem cell. So you have skin stem cells, you've got cartilage stem cells, you've got ligament stem cells, liver stem cells, and all that. What was cool about this is that what he was doing, he was actually programming these cells to actually grew skin. Now, those are called IPCs, but that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about regular stem cells. So in the early 2000s, 
there was a couple of companies that started working with stem cells and they were getting stem cells from two different locations. They were getting from fat in, in the animal's body, um, which the medical terms called adipose, A-D-I-P-O-S-E, but they were getting from fat and they were getting these cells that were, and we got, the, we talked about the um, embryonic stem cells. Now we're talking about cells that they call multipotent in nature. They're called mesenchyme cells. These cells, they're great, and they, they, they've been around forever. They're really good in orthopedic uh, issues. Now, what do they do? So what, what they're doing when they're harvesting these stem cells, they're getting these cells that have not been given a definition. They're not a skin stem cell. They're not a liver stem cell. They're just basically a generic cell that hasn't been told what it's supposed to do. So this company that started this originally, a company by the name of VetStem, um, they actually got these cells from fat, and then they activated the cells and then re-injected them into the target areas they're trying to treat, mainly orthopedic issues. And they're treating cats, dogs, horses, that kind of thing there. But the other uh, area that they were getting stem cells, again, not mine, but they're getting stem cells from bone marrow. Now, you always hear about bone marrow when you're talking about leukemia and that. And one of the things when they're treating leukemia with bone marrow, the stem cells play a part in that for the healing as well. But the problem with bone marrow, first of all, it's, it's really painful. Secondly, is they can't get enough. So when they actually get the uh, bone marrow cells, they have to, when they take it to a lab, it's called expansion. They actually grow more cells to treat mainly, again, orthopedic issues. Um, the problem with that is, aside from the, you're using anesthesia and you're using all these other things, the problem with that is, is that when you're regrowing these cells, it's expansion. The second generation cells are bigger and they're just not as potent as the original cells that they were. Both technologies are good technologies. I, I wouldn't say anything other than that. And it's a great option instead of doing using steroids or surgery and all these other things as well. Now, so that they started doing treating animals in the early 2000s. And you can fast forward today. My company, um, there was a, uh, we worked with some pioneers in the stem cell world. We knew that there were stem cells in blood. And the problem with them, they were very, very small. And they're, they're actually, they're a more potent cell. They're pluripotent in nature. So if you think of a hierarchy, at the very top of it would be an embryonic stem cell. We don't want to use those. One of the reasons why we don't use embryonic stem cells, again, we're not getting from embryos, but if you're getting embryonic stem cells, they're actually trying to grow a bean. And so when you're grow, when they're, when they're, when you use them, they have problems with people getting tumors, not cancerous tumors, but tumors that are called teratomas. What a teratoma is, if you, if you stood in line in a grocery store and you see these the old inquiry there, you see some like really gross looking thing that had teeth and eyes and stuff like that. That's a tumor, teratoma. It's trying to be a bean, even though it's not a bean. So what the way the, the hierarchy works is that you've got these embryonic stem cells. And then the minute, the very millisecond that any beans born, animal or human, cells are now considered adult stem cells. And so what we're doing now is we're trying to find these cells to repair, regenerate, replace, and do a lot of different things that these cells can do. And what we get from blood is what they call, um, it's called a B cell, very small embryonic like without all the negative things, stem cell that's pluripotent in nature. So it's a little bit more potent. And so what, what these cells do, they'll actually, re so what they'll do is we get these, again, we get these with a minimally invasive procedure we get these cells that um, can do amazing things. I'll give you a story. So I was working with a, um, a very highly respected, speaks at a lot of these veterinary concerts, uh, um, I'm sorry, veterinary uh, shows. He called me one time, said, I've got this dog that's got stage four, basically into life, stage four liver disease. And he says, and the owners are just, they're, they're, they don't know. And I, I, I said, well, I've got this new technology. Should we, do you want to try it? And the, the owner said, please, please, we'll do whatever we can. And it's a really heartwarming story. So he calls me up and he says, what do you think? I said, well, let's try it. We hadn't tr treated any liver disease at this time with this new technology. So basically what we did then, we drew blood from this dog. 
He got it, and then he injected not into the liver, but just on the outside of the liver. liver. Typically, when you hear a medical term, peri, P-E-R-I, you'll hear the, this. When you buy a liver, it's called perihepatic. Think, think hepatitis. So he just injected a little bit in that area, and the rest in an IV um, in the arm like you'd see in the hospital for yourself. He had a bag of saline. You'll have it in the saline. It went in there. Well, about... I can't remember now, probably two or three weeks later, by, by the way, my, I'm at my home office. So my dog is going to join us and she, she joins me. And every time I'm on this thing anyways, anyways, long story short, that would, be a, that would be a first. I mean, I don't know how many times Zuzu or Clementine, my dogs no. have this or Tina's dog. So, you know, it's family dog pod test. It's okay. <laughs> oh, that's good. Cause my dog definitely wants to join. <laughs> he always does. Her name's Mabel, by the way. Um, anyways. So, he tr- we treat this dog, and about three weeks later, he's driving with his wife, and the phone rings. And he looks at his wife, and he says, "Oh, this is a pet owner. I'm, I, I know we're going to hear some bad news." He call, he answers the phone. The lady's crying, happy tears. She says, "Oh my God, I can't remember the dog's name now." Uh, anyways, um, the the so and so is is eating. Their coat is better, and this dog started doing well. And that dog lived, it was an older dog, lived three more years without having to be treated again with liver disease. But that's just one of the stories that we've got. And I've, I've got tons to tell you and all the different disorders we treat. And it's just an amazing technology. So, so you said something when we when you started uh, talking about all of this, that it's not used for cancer. So yeah. I have a two-part question. So the first sure. is, um, why not cancer? And then also, is that a no, never cancer or a not yet for treating cancer? Okay, it's a no, not yet. So there's some studies now that are being done. They're figuring how to do come up, come up with a protocol to target that area. So it's not there yet. We're not there yet. And we haven't really focused on that because we're targeting some of the other areas that we're treating. We're doing a lot of neural disorders and some other things that this, there's no, no other options for it. But it's not it's not a never. It's this it's around the corner kind of a thing. So are you starting to see that the work that's being done in the veterinary world with stem cells is starting to inform m- medical for humans as well, that there's more of a it's more accepted in dogs at, or cats as it's more accepted as you guys are doing these things than the the medical professionals for humans are getting more and more curious about it. Now, what's interesting about that, I think that they've been working on stem cells in the human alongside with the animal forever. The problem we have here in the U.S., in my opinion, is that because we can't mass produce stem cells because it's our, coming from our body, that big pharma doesn't like it yet because they can't make money off of it. Really, that again, my opinion, you know, what's interesting is what I always find really curious is that PRP, platelet-rich plasma, which I talked about earlier, is completely acceptable in the human world. It's been used forever. And if you if you look it up, you'll see a lot of professional athletes use it and all that. The problem with PRP is that it's great for anti-inflammation, but it only lasts for 45 to 60 days. So it's not, it's not a, it's a, it's a big, a big uh, thing of ice. You're going to put it in inflammation and take care of it. But What's crazy about it is the way we get stem cells, there's a lot more steps involved. It's very similar to PRP, but because stem cells do so much more and they're long lasting, that's why we're having the roadblock, I guess, in the human world. Because I, I, they are doing this, this similar technology outside of the U.S. With good, tech, with good results, too. It's the same result. It's no big deal. It's just that, again, big pharma can't mass produce it. I think we'll see it someday you know, just because of bioengineering and all that. But I do think we'll see it because I really think the future in medicine across the board is immunotherapy and stem cell therapy is really what we're going to do moving forward. Right. Like teaching the body how to heal itself. Exactly. You know, that's the nice thing about this. You know, the, I'll tell you the pros about this thing. And so if you're, we're using our body, we're waking up our body. So I, this is what I always explain to people. So we've got these stem cells that aren't doing anything. So what we're doing is kind of like having your Two children, they're twins. One does their homework all the time. They get a straight A. Then you got the, the the one that's equally smart, but never does their homework. And they've got, they're getting C's all the time. So what we're doing is we're taking these stem cells and we're going, you're going to sit at that table and do your homework until you, until you get an A. And so what we're doing is we're making these stem cells 
do their homework and they're coming back in the body and doing what they're supposed to do. So that's basically what we're doing because we've got all these cells there. You know, just like anything else, our body isn't always doing what we wanted to do. We've got this great machine, but sometimes we got to get a we got to get some repairs done. Those slacker cells. <laughs> so there's a bunch of ed- evidence out there. That, so even with these other co- uh, companies that are getting either from the fat or they're getting from bone marrow, they've been treating orthopedic issues forever. So bone repair, ligament repair, cartilage repair across the board. Now, if you had a full on torn ligament, a stem cell is not going to put it together. So they'd have to have surgery. So oftentimes, as an example, I get a dog that's got a, um, a torn ligament, they'll do surgery and stem cells combined with it because it will repair it. So basically what a stem cell is, actually, let's define what a stem cell is. Stem cells consider what they call a ma- master cell. It's also considered a repair cell. So basically, we're talking regenerative medicine. So basically, what we're doing is we're taking these master repair cells and saying, okay, guys, go do your job. The crazy thing about it is we've got these generic cells, right? And so what we do, either any of the technology, we, get, we go and we wake these cells up and say, go do your homework. When they come back in, what they do is they home in. Our technology uses, uh, there's a thing called a parathyroid hormone that's kind of like a lighthouse. It's and it's got a receptor beaming where there's da- damage and saying, okay, come here, cells, come here. So let's just go with uh, a cartilage. So what happens is, is the cells will go to this because of the, the lighthouse saying, come here. They'll come there. Now, again, they haven't been given a definition. This is what's amazing about science is they go there, they find the damage, they attach themselves to it, and they become basically a cartilage cell, and then they create this thing called proliferation. They start growing more cartilage cells to repair it. So basically, we're going, okay, here it is. The light comes on. Okay, I'm going to turn into one of these things. Now I'm going to create more of these things to repair that. I mean, it does it across the board for all these different things. So it's this amazing process. And again, it's proliferation. They'll grow more cells once we get these guys going and targeting the areas that they're supposed to target. So is that why maybe not cancer yet? Because if they were to somehow come across a mutated mm. cell, a cancer cell, that there's a little bit of a risk of like, no, no. I, love they, I love them getting to ask you all the questions. I, I love being asked a question because I, you know, trust me, I can talk forever. So now, so one of the things with our technology in particular, one of the concerns when we first started doing this, we, if a dog had a dog, cat or, or horse had cancer, we were we kind of, we shy away from it. We, these cells are non-tumeric, they're non-tumor growing. We don't have an issue whatsoever that, that, that we, they don't do that. So that's, it, it, make, it makes sense that it should, but it doesn't. So we don't have to be concerned about that at all. They just haven't figured out how, could, what you're really trying to do in cancer, trying to eliminate something versus repair something. So that's where they're trying to figure out how do we get into that cell and make it become a healthy cell basically that's what we're, what we wanted to do they just haven't got there yet so we're going to talk about some other let's talk about some other things we're treating so first of all the, the other two companies out there that are doing this they're mainly treating for the most part orthopedic issues so anything there's orthopedic our success rate here's some pros and cons about stem cells one the pro is it's it's minimally invasive you're not doing surgery it's not quite as costly as surgery it's not inexpensive but it's not crazy. Most stem cell therapies are covered by pet insurance, by the way, for people that are listening. So that's a really good thing too. That's really good to know because that's going to be my best. Yeah, that's that's a biggie. Yeah, it is a biggie. And you know what I like to tell everybody because the validation said, okay, maybe it does work if insurance companies are being where must be doing something right. So that's a good thing too. Because everybody kind of, you know, you, you know, I've seen there was a big 60 minutes deal on a human deal that were doing stem cells. And there are companies out there, not in the medical, uh, not in the veterinary world that I'm aware of, but there are a lot in the human world promising all these different things. And you just, it's, you know, they're just snake oil salesmen. So one of the, one of the things about what I, what I tell pet owners and I tell veterinarians on a regular basis is it doesn't always work. And the way I explain it, this is if you and I have an injured knee, same injury, same doctor, go and get both great results from the surgery. One of us may turn out to be better than the other. So with stem cell, we're relying on our body or the dog's body, the cat's body or the horse's body to repair itself. Not everybody repairs themselves as well. So that's the negative on it. That's the only negative, by the way. There's no adverse reactions whatsoever. 
So are you finding that it's, you can, that there are other factors that tend to become more predictive, like age or uh, nutrition or how their immune system's functioning? No, we haven't, you know, and there's, we're, there's some studies going on trying to figure out why it works better in some than others, but we don't, we don't have that answer yet. Um, we just don't. What's great about this technology, though, this is, a, I mean, we treated some, amazing, so I just get excited talking about this stuff. So what's great about it is so um, not only do we treat orthopedic issues, matter of fact, bone repair is a big deal. Wound repair, actually PRP, like an example, randomly, I had a, somebody, a, a veterinary wanted to treat a llama. And so they had this, they had cartilage damage, uh, ligament damage, a big open, open wound. And one, they repaired it doing our typical technology. Then they took the PRP, put it all along this wound. And you should have seen how fast that thing healed. It was pretty amazing. But the great thing about the technology we have now using these B cells, again, the, they're pluripotent in nature. So we mean, so back, I started to say the hierarchy. So you've got the the um, embryonic stem cell, which is the top of the uh, the totem pole. And then we do get these atoms, uh, adult stem cells, and you have what we call pluripotent, which is the cell we use what we get from the blood. And the next level down is pluripotent, which is what you get from fat or adipose. And again, they're both really good technologies. The way I explain ours is, I love analogies. So ours is um, similar to cell phone technology. Those technologies are like a flip phone. They work great. If you got a text, it's a pain in the butt to do. You can't really get on the internet, but our technology, I kind of consider a smartphone. I can still call everybody with both of them. I can do a lot of things. So ours is easier to do and it does more things. That's a simple way of saying it. So here's some crazy stuff. So not only do we treat liver disease and kidney disease. Now, one of our protocols, we work with a lot of integrative uh, veterinarians and if they're integrative and they do acupuncture, one of the part of the protocol, they actually inject some of the stem cells using the meridian points that you would use in acupuncture. So as an example, you have a meridian point that affects your kidneys. So if we're treating kidney disease, so when acupuncture is in the dog world, usually they do B12 in the, in the acupuncture meridian points. What's crazy about this, and I can't, I can't 100% tell you, but I know for a fact it's true. So when you treat a lot of these older animals that have kidney disease, I've heard it so many times now, this makes me laugh when I say it now. So we treat these dogs, their kidneys start repairing and these dogs start hearing better because kidneys and hearing is related and older dogs don't hear. And I've had pet owners come me, so-and-so, Fido, it's now barking like the happiest thing. He hears me when I call them now. I said, they were just ignoring you before, <laughs> but no, really. So we hear it. I can't go to the dog and say, okay, when I make this sound, lift your paw. But we're, I hear, I've heard it, I don't know how many times, tens of times. I have a question. I was actually just at my acupuncturist today and I have, oh, cool. I have having an eye issue. So she treated my liver meridians. So my right. question for you is if you are treating liver disease, are dogs seeing better? I, I, I haven't asked them to look at the chart lately, <laughs> but if they would look at the chart and point out and say, read that line below, I could tell you for sure. Probably. They probably, they probably are. I just, there's no way to do it. And what's great about it is, you know that it, it's not a placebo effect. They're actually, it's working because they're doing it, which right. is kind of cool. Okay. And my, my other question is, you were telling me you treat liver and kidney disease. Do you treat chronic illnesses like Cushing's or Addison's? Can you treat that with stem cells? I've, we've treated Cushing's twice that I'm aware of. I don't always hear about all the cases. And we've heard some good news about it, but I can't tell you 100% of it if we've had it. I, I don't know about, I don't know if we have or haven't. Certainly it's the big names you've heard, but here's, the, here's another one that we treat. Again, liver disease, we've done in-stage liver disease. We've done great. We were going to do result. Uh, actually, we we're going to do a study with UC Davis, one of the top vet schools in the country on kidney disease. And then, of course, COVID came and everything went crazy. And now all the vets are so overworked and overwhelmed because they're all short staffed across the country. We just haven't, we're not, we don't have the, uh, they don't have the capacity to take the time to help us with doing some studies. But we've had great results with kidney disease. And other technologies, I think they treat them a little bit, but they don't really have the success we have. But here's the big one, neural disorders. So in dogs, ALS and humans, there's a disorder called degenerative myelopathy. And for the pet owners out there that are listening, they've got one. They know exactly what it is. Yeah, I, the, I have uh, I have historically had Doberman pinchers as a part so of the group. Know. So we know about this. Yes, and we had a dog, same thing. Um, and our, pugs. Yeah. Right. I had a pug, yeah. same thing. Like we start to learn about these things. 
Well, I'm going to send you, I'll, when we get done, I'll email you a video. That's, that's, and I remember the dog's name was Adobe. And he was um, paralyzed and he was rescued. And his name was Dozer. I remember his name even. Because um, the pet owner sent me about a mile worth of film that I had to cut. <laughs> it was driving me crazy. It took up all my space in my computer. But anyways, this dog, they, they did everything with the dog. He couldn't even walk. And they, they, they were, you know, the, the helicopter parent, beyond helicopter parent kind of thing. Did acupuncture, did all these different things, tire pack for about six months. And they got the dog where he could kind of stand up and really couldn't walk. And then we came in and did uh, stem cells. And I want to say within 45 days, I have videos of him getting out of the bed. And then I have a video of him running in the backyard. It was a pretty amazing thing. So we're treating, we've, I mean, we treat DM uh, really pretty regularly. The problem with neural disorders are, so let's go back to everything. So we were talking originally about orthopedic issues. I would say 95% of the time we get positive results. And generally, again, that's, let me also stress, we're not curing. We're, we're repairing and we're reversing. So oftentimes, as an example, we're treating, let's say, arthritis in an animal. On average, our, the length of time that we, we kind of reverse it back, we're not getting rid of it. So um, we get probably 16 months of really quality time, and then they may have to come back in at 16 months. It could be nine months. It could be two years. But on average, probably around 16 months is the average. So I would say... 95, if not more percent of the time, we have positive results treating anything in orthopedic. If we're treating um, uh, neural disorders like uh, degenerative myelopathy or wobblers, which is another big one in horses and Great Danes and and, and, and doves. And doves, exactly. They're, they're notorious. The Great Danes and dobies are the big ones to get it. We have probably 75% of the time really have great results with it. So when you're with your doby, are they doing the, the paw thing where they put it upside down and see so, how long you can flip it? So the, the dog I have right now is only three, right? We okay. don't we don't have any of that stuff yet. But I mean, as I mean, my parents bred Doberman Pinchers in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. And really, at that point, we were near Cornell, right? So if sure. if somebody had a case of wobblers, we were going to Cornell and it was basically a death sentence. It what was. Is? You're watching it was, this you're going to maintain this dog as long as you can. And when you can't, then you let them right. go. So hearing a 75%, you know, success know. rate, and maybe not a dog with perfect gait, but a dog who's functional and happy and reasonably healthy, that, I mean, that's a game changer, Mark. It makes me wonder about like MS and people. Are they treating MS and people with this? I, yeah, they're doing a bunch of studies on that. You know, it's funny we do this, and this is absolutely true. I get goosebumps when you start talking about it because it really makes me excited. Right, to talk no, because this is amazing. It is. I know. And it's, the bad, the, the funny thing is, is that getting the word out with for stem cells for animals, but always people about humans, but they don't realize it's for animals. So here's, this is a crazy thing. So when they're testing a dog that's either got degenerative myelopathy, what I, what I say DM, wobblers what they'll do is if you're a pet owner and has one of those you'll probably you'll know this they'll take their paw and they'll flip it back and they see how long it takes them to flip it back again and so if, stay if it goes back exactly I mean, I've so that's, said, yes, you just exactly. stand on it upside down oh, it's awful yes. it is yeah. it's terrible to watch well i i'm going to send you another video i'm getting goosebumps again so another one of a great dane and that dog's name was Santiago. So I'm remembering some of the names. I'm pretty good for an old guy. Anyway, so uh, maybe I need some stem cells. Anyway, so what... Uh, so Don't stage, we all? Yeah, trust me. Um, stage four, when this flip test we're talking about, it takes them longer than I think it's 12 seconds to flip back. That dog, the dog, that I, the one video that I'm thinking about, Santiago, I think it was the stage four. So it took him like 12, 10 or 12 seconds to do it. When 45 days, he's at stage one. So he could he was he was flipping it with stage one, I think, and I don't remember the 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 metrics on it. It's like uh, zero to three or four seconds, but complete difference. And there's what I love about the video, it's the vet took it, but he I had somebody in the, the clinic was taking the video, and you hear him in the background, wow, look at that. I hear the vet. I love hearing what the vet says. And so he didn't even realize we were recording it. So what about things like Diabetes. 
Now we haven't treated that yet. We're, you know, we're, we're going on the right now because it's our technology. This technology I have has been around for about 10 years now. And so we've had to develop protocols and constantly tweaking our protocols and targeting the bigger things that we have diabetes. We, we haven't treated, but what's funny is I'm constantly finding new things and, and actually playing around with things on a regular basis to see if we can find something. The nice thing about uh, stem cells is there's no adverse reaction. So worst case scenario, we don't get good results. Be- a best case scenario we do. So there, there's no, other than economics, there's no thing why you wouldn't do it. You know, growing up, I always had, uh, our family always had uh, German shepherds and they always had the hip issues, right? Hip dysplasia and all that. One of our dogs that did a TPLO where they actually cut the ball off on, on the mm-hmm. dog, which is a pretty common thing. And that dog couldn't walk again. We had it in a cart for a while. It was just horrible. I felt so horrible. I, I would get anything to be able to go back in time right. and give those dogs there. So let's talk, actually, let's talk about hip dysplasia too, because that's a big one. Yeah. I get, I, I get asked questions about this all the time. So most people don't, when you don't, they probably are told by the vet, if not, it's a mechanical issue which really causes that. But the problem is, is so... Stem cells can't fix mechanics, but we can fix the biologics. And what that means is we can, like, what happens when the mechanics there, they lose their cartilage and the ligaments there. So we're repairing the, their cartilage in there and completely reversing that for, you know, again, life and being able to be, make them active again. And so what we're doing is repairing the biologics to make these dogs live a you know, quality of life and a happier life. It's what we're doing. We're not fixing it, but we're certainly making it better. So when you, I was going to say, I was going to, when you were talking about the fact that, that you're looking towards repair, it seems to me that something like dysplasia um, would be a perfect candidate for this because you have an actual zone that needs repair. Right. Like you have a chronic illness such as Cushing's, Addison's, diabetes, that's a that's a chronic condition that affects a lot of different systems in the body and would be much harder to target because you don't have a specific area that you're you're trying to repair. Yes, yes and no. So what because we we have you know you have to kind of go after certain areas which is where you're absolutely correct. So let me just walk around like a protocol. Like if as an example, we were treating a hip. What we would do, we would inject a small amount of stem cells with the PRP, the prep, the using that acronym into the hip, but the majority of, and, and then we would do acupuncture points were associated with that. If the vet does it, does it, I have several vets that don't do that and it still works fine, but we just, there, we have a theory that it's better to do it that way if they can. And the rest is IV. So I, when I always talk about IV and, and what's nice about these cells are so small, they go through the, the, the brain, the brain barrier. So they can get right through to get to everything. So they're going in and what they're doing is they're going through is the way I explain to everybody, because I have to think the way I think, is our road system. So when we get into the IV, they're going in and they're homing down on anything that's damaged. Here's it. Again, this could be wish, wishful thinking, but it's not. Um, we try, I, I've got a, a vet that I work with really closely out in Las Vegas, and this guy's just, I've got stories and punch stories of what he, of crazy things he's done in the in the animal world. But we treated this American bulldog, and I have a video of this dog basically crawling into the to the clinic comes back you know a couple of weeks later and he's walking like nothing ever happened came back about a year and a half later he's walking slower but that second time we treated him he was better now in my mind now again i drank the kool-aid a long time ago so you have to be real careful about what i tell everybody so my theory without having proof of this is that when you treat treat an animal the second time or the third time what's happened is when you're treating the first time you don't know how much damage everything else is so these cells are homing in and repairing them when they come back again about um you know whatever it is a year to two years later they don't have to repair as more and so the results are better because they're homing in on some of the other things and making them better i'll tell you a, a secret so i've had stem cell uh, therapy done to myself three times and the first time, it was done out of the country um, with a guy who was doing similar technology for me. And I just noticed this, and it was just IV. I wasn't, I, I played a lot of sports. I've had eight knee surgeries, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't target any joints. You did IV. 
I noticed a subtle difference. I figured, man, as soon as I get to go out and run a marathon the next day, it'd be no problem. I didn't notice that at all. The second time I did it, I noticed a bigger difference. And I did it about a year later. The third time I did it was unbelievable. And and what was amazing for me was, again, I didn't target joints because I, I didn't have a doctor that could do that. My brain power was, I, I got more done for the first three months of having that stem cell therapy than I had done in years. I was so more focused, laser focused, it's like I had a dirty windshield and cleaned my windshield off. It was amazing. So I believe that because I had done it three years in succession, that I had less damage and I was, just, I was getting better results. It sounds like it might be a possible uh, treatment for Alzheimer's or other dementias. I think so. I, I, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I have to be careful well, what I, I know say. You're not saying it, but <laughs> what you were saying makes My it personal belief <laughs> that it, that that could be an area of research that might be very productive. The other thing that I was thinking of when you were saying that each, each subsequent treatment shows greater improvement, that's the opposite of cancer treatment. Exactly. I remember when my dogs was having cancer treatment, she said the most effective is going to be the first round because it's a naive cancer. It's never seen what's going to hit it. Oh, that's interesting. And so you hit it and you do really well. But if it comes back, it's no longer naive. It's smarter. And it gets so smarter. It gets smart. Yeah. So you have to hit it either with something else, which may not be as effective, or if you hit it with the same thing, it's not going to be as effective because the cancer is no longer naive. Oh, that makes and sense. so you get the decreased um, improvement, whereas with the stem cell, you're talking exactly the opposite, where you have an improvement and then a bigger improvement and then a bigger improvement, completely opposite from your traditional cancer treatment. Well, um, and again, I, I want to say I'm not a vet. I don't play one on TV. This was just my personal experience. <laughs> yeah. I'm not this is true for every cancer. This is just what we found. Okay, and I want to clarify my part too. This is my theory too. This is not me saying one. I'm, you know, one of the things what I I always tell the vets to have the if I have the time to talk to the pet owners because I want to be really honest about it because it's not a cure all. You know, stem cells are, you know, you know, as, as you guys know, I have a podcast and I was talking to some of an integrative veterinarians. I, you know, it's another tool in the tool veterinary toolbox, right? It's a, it's a great solution if you want to avoid surgery, you know, if you want to avoid steroids, you want to avoid all these things. It's definitely something that I, even though it's my deal, I absolutely 100%, 110% believe in, in it's, it's a better option than a lot of the other options out there now. And it may be one of those deals where we do it and it doesn't work or it doesn't work as well. And you have to go with some more traditional things. But it's to me, it's my first choice. It really is. So I'm curious in the situations where it doesn't work, is it it's fixing something we didn't know about? Well, exactly. So that's the thing that you don't know, because especially when this IV, again, I liken it to Pac-Man. You know, you've got these little things going with their mouth and, blah, 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 and they're looking for anything they can. And they're, right. they're definitely repairing something. So, Absolutely. Yeah, so that would that would almost make me go, no, we need to follow up with an additional treatment. And like we need to do a series of three mm -hmm. because maybe that wasn't what the stem cells viewed as the most pressing matter. That's the yeah. other question I would have for you is, OK, so we're introducing it through an IV. Is it going to the the physically first thing it runs into or is it like how? Have you figured out how the cells decide what they're going to help? Well, that's the whole thing with the parathyroid hormone, right? So you've got a parathyroid hormone receptors that are pointing to it. Now, to be a little bit more, uh, let me be clarify something a little bit. So as an example, if I'm treating um, the school of joints, livers, kidneys, we're also going to put stem cells in that area as well. So we're targeting that too. So are the, the one issue we have with treating neural disorders, the recommended protocol is the, a thing that it's kind of like a spinal tap, it's called interthecally. So they'll actually put something in, put a, a very small amount of stem cells into the, basically the electrical system, right? I have vets that just aren't, they, they learned how to do interthecal injections when they were in vet school. Years later, they haven't done it. They weren't comfortable doing it. And they just did IV and we still got results. 
I am a firm belief that you go to the area too. So I'm not, I, if, if they can do it, I want them to do that. And the other thing is, is doing the acupuncture points. I, you know, that medicine has been around for a long time and I, I have faith in it. So if they don't do it again, we get good results. I'm just more confident. We're, I'm going to be more positive that we're going to get results if we can do the targeted areas like we we're talking about. But so we are targeting areas. But again, going back to my what I was saying, you and I get knee surgery. One of us may be better than the other for whatever reason. It's crazy. Here's a crazy thing, too, I should bring up. So what's great about this, <laughs> it's good and bad. So we could treat these dogs that are arthritic or whatever, and they get out. I call it a PRP high, platelet-rich plasma thing again. What happens, they feel so good. They want to run around, and we have to tell the pet owners, slow them down. Don't let them They're going to hurt themselves. And they end up, I've heard stories where the dogs are going, hey, I feel great. I'm going to jump on the bed. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Next thing you know, they're limping around because they haven't done anything for a while. Like the people who worked with you when you're, when your windshield got clean, you were, exactly. you were tiring their butts out, dude. <laughs> exactly. Like if this is you with a clean windshield, I imagine you with a dirty windshield was. Oh, no, I don't <laughs> have the clean. I, the day is a dirty windshield. Trust me. I got more energy. You're back I to was, dirty windshield. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely a dirty windshield. <laughs> it <laughs> <But> wore off. <laughs> I, it's funny. The guy that I had, that I had to do it, it retired. So I haven't been able, I, I would do it to, again today in a heartbeat. It was amazing. I'm telling you, it was one of the most amazing things I've done. Which well, the great thing about it is I was my own guinea pig, right? So going back to the question we're talking about on the on the human side, is this thing with the um what's going on with the animals, is it giving more information to the to the uh the uh human side? So what's crazy about most people don't realize. So if you do a study in the animal world, generally it's like six animals, right? They'll do a study with six animals. Because even though we think of them differently, some people don't. And so the great thing about that is we're finding out technologies by that versus going through thousands of people going through stay, you know, you know, phase one, two, three, or four clinical trials in the human world. So we can do that. And I think I, to answer it differently, I think what it's doing is encouraging people to do studies on the human side saying, hey, we saw some results here. Now let's do let's do a real real close study and see what happens on that. That's probably a good example of how that works. I like the fact that you mentioned that, um, you know, owners need to go slowly because one of the things they need to remember is that their dog is not conditioned. If your dog has, has not been moving around and has been a lot more sedentary <laughs> because it's been in pain or whatever, we don't have the muscles build up or the ligaments or any of that stuff so that even though you're feeling better, that's great. Let's build you back up again. I was thinking about when my, um, when my uh, burner had um, knee surgery and one of the things that we did was, you know, is most people know the ACL in dogs is usually considered a bilateral condition, which means if one side goes, the other one. Everyone's goes. going, yeah. But what we found was that if we did physical therapy, if I paid for the physical therapy, including underwater treadmill, which the retriever loved, the burner was like, no, thank you. Um, that neither one of my dogs had to have the other side done because we took good care of the first side. And so I think that that's a really important thing to remember is just because the dog is feeling better doesn't mean we're actually back to being a puppy. Well, and the other thing, the way I was, I explain to people and it, I always, I, let's, let's think of yourself, right? So if I go on and get knee surgery, what are they going to do with me? They're going to make limit me, uh, limit me on everything. And I have physical therapy and I, and I tell the vets to make sure they tell, and most good vets would do it anyways, but I said, make sure you tell them. They've got to build a foundation of strength to do that the same way as they would do it. So you have to think of yourself and then think of your animal. Cause if you, it was the same thing was done to you, what would you be allowed to do? Not very much. And that's what they do. You know what I do too, lots of times for people that can't afford to be on the treadmill or that I tell them, get a, a, a plastic pool and water and get to just walk them around in a circle in the water to build up their strength that way, just to get them to do some stuff that in your control in the environment as well. Um, Mark, could you talk a little bit about um, the cost of all this? And and we did sure. mention it covered by insurance, but I think people would like to have a bit of an idea about what the cost might be, whether or not, because if you don't have insurance, this is something that, that the average owner can afford. Right. So it's expensive. So um, typically, I, and I don't get involved with the veterinarian's charge. Typically, I'd hear anywhere from $1,800 to about $3,000 is what they're charging. 
but it, it varies because and the reason it varies is one probably uh their area that they're in whatever the economic area is probably for one two is is that depends on what they're doing for example they may do mris they may do some other stuff just to verify everything you don't know what you know you've got your visit whatever your normal visit is and they're doing a, so basically let me explain what works how mine works and again ours is a smartphone versus a flip phone again the other technologies are good but ours is um the other ones are similar but different so the nice thing about our technology is all you're doing is a blood draw so you would take your pet in let's say a monday take them in they would do a blood draw and you go home and then what they do is they ship it off to our lab and we process it we isolate the stem cells and the prp and then we send it back to them so typically if you came in on a monday the vet would probably treat them on a wednesday or a thursday or um you know generally right when they get it back so it's a 48 hour turnaround the crazy thing about it is now think about surgery and the downtime you have if you're doing knees or whatever if there's a partial tear or whatever they go in they're in the you know you're probably in the office when you do a blood draw probably half an hour or less depending on how long you have to wait in the waiting room then you come back when they treat these animals they're out within an hour or less so that's a really fast and it, you know it's almost it's like you know it's almost like magic at some level because you know that's all they did but we're doing we're basically got these you know i was like nano robots going in and say okay go do something go fix it and they're doing it it's pretty crazy when um when my dog um when my dog Bingley my flat coat had cancer he had histiocytic sarcoma um we did um cancer treatment at MedVet but I had an integrated vet and I did a lot of supportive care for him we did acupuncture we did um chiropractic we also did plasma treatments and, oh good and uh, that was really helpful I think it, what what the plasma treatments did was I think they helped to keep him comfortable mm-hmm. and feeling. We're like a normal dog for as long as as we we could until the cancer finally took him. But um, it it I found it made a, a huge difference. The biggest problem we had was um, near the end of his cancer treatment was finding a vein to get the plasma. Um, yeah, his, his veins were starting to go with the uh, with the cancer treatment. But well, even then, then that was like six or seven years ago. So I know it wasn't stem cell stuff, but it was plasma. And they took they took his blood. Sp- Spun the plasma down and then re-injected it into him. Well, that, and it that's made a huge difference. Made him happier. One of the things I should mention too, so when we're when we're getting our platelets, one of the things we do is called lacerating. We're actually taking the platelets through what they call sonification. We're bursting those flat platelets to get just all those proteins in there when we do that. The reason being, if you talk to any in a, a person that may have had PRP treatment, it's pretty painful because platelets are pretty big. So we're eliminating that and we immediately they're getting an effect of the anti-inflammatories and it's also healing as well. It's healing factors as well as anti-inflammatory, but the anti-inflammatory, it's amazing when you see these, these guys, they get, I mean, that's, it's almost instantaneous. So there are clinics out there and I discourage this with people that will do um, not because it's not a bad technology, just it's your, it's a band aid. So they'll just do PRP for, for an animal. They'll feel good for about, it lasts 45 to 60 days max. And then 60 days, you're right back to where you were. You're not, you're, you're not addressing the problem. You're just, you're, you're reacting to it. And so that's why combining the stem cells with the PRP, what I love about the PRP with the stem cells, they're getting this anti-inflammatory where the stem cells are doing their, their job. What we do also on our end, if it's, if we get enough volume, we will actually, um, if we get enough volume, we'll actually uh, send extra PRP to the vet. We don't always have it because plasma levels vary. And so what they'll do, a lot of the vets, when we, we treat them, and that, they don't charge for it. We'll, they can actually freeze this because we, we burst these because it's a protein. So what happens, you get treated, you come back in for your fault visit at you know 30 to 45 days or whatever. They give you more PRP. Now you've got basically almost four months of anti-inflammatories while the stem cells are repairing everything and doing things. So it actually really adds an added benefit. That is really cool stuff. Um, Mark, we are so, so excited that you joined us. Um, This is just amazing information that I think are, we have a lot of listeners, not only do we have families, we got vet techs, we've got vets, we've got a lot of trainers. 
we have a pretty diverse audience. So what we're hoping is that this is going to get information out to those who can actually do something with it. So thank you so much for joining us. I, I think I Tina would agree with me that we would desperately love to have you come back anytime. Sure. You know, because you know where the link is. Just go and <laughs> sign up and you can come back, especially and, if you get any new technology or any new information in. Oh, absolutely. And for, for all the families who get extra time, right? It's so precious. Yeah. Like, thank you. And yeah, I'm right there with you going... I'm thinking about dogs in the past that I'm like, oh, I wish we had known. But yeah, I also am so hopeful for the future, not just for dogs and cats and horses, but for people too. That that I just wish there was a way that the the economic part wasn't such a big part of it, right? That that we could get um so like solving MS would be a game changer for so many families, right? Like Absolutely. even if it was even a Band-Aid, like even a Band-Aid is still a big, big quality of life issue. So, so thank you for the beautiful gifts you're giving to the world. Well, I so appreciate the time you've given me. And I put this out here with a, a little being cautious of doing it. There are times if there's that special case that somebody doesn't have the economic things that will donate something to somebody, but it's got to be a, I don't want to float people calling in, but uh, for that special case, the grandmother out there that just can't afford it and, and do that, we'll do whatever we can to help people out as well. I mean, it's, it's about giving back. By giving back, you get more things anyways. Well, thank, thank you again. We just would love to have you come back anytime and talk to us about, about uh, what it is that you do. And we wish you all the best of luck and that you keep uh, making tremendous advances in stem cell research. And well, yes, and- and you have a podcast, so I can go yeah. learn more. Oh, yeah. So anybody that's out there, our, our, it's a different kind of podcast. We're, I'm talking to rescue groups and a variety of things that's called the, <laughs> of course, is my personality, For Real, F-U-R, For Real podcast. It's on all the platforms. And one thing I wanted to tell you, Tina, I, I was reading that you you got your, um, your dogs from Turks and Caicos. I just had a woman on the podcast and it's not released yet from Aruba and about her rescue group out there and with, with the dogs there at one point in Aruba, there were, there's 105,000 people there and there were 40,000 stray animals on the island. So one third of the population were stray, but it's it's not. So I'm, I'm talking to another person with Island dogs. So I know all about that. It's pretty funny. Yeah, it's, um, they're very, very interesting. And, and they're even interesting from just a veterinary population, yeah. right? Because you're talking about animals that have been on island. And so they give us a really um, amazing look into yeah. what, into what a captive um, group of dogs, how that goes. Like what, for example, I see tons of tons. I see three times a year eight or nine month old puppies who are hypo thyratic. Yeah. Which should be impossible. Exactly. Yet we see it. And when we treat it, we see huge changes in behavior and the dogs are more stable. So I love hearing your kidney and hearing because yeah, my dog who had kidney issues lost his hearing. Yeah. So uh, maybe I would have watched for kidney earlier if I had known that there was some sort of link there. So yeah, now you've got me down going down rabbit holes. Thanks. <laughs> we needed, needed some stem cells. We need to clean up your windshield. <laughs> well, right. my, my windshield arguably has like corn growing on it. So yeah, <laughs> we're so glad you're here and thank you so yes. much. And I look forward to when we can talk to you again. Okay, guys, take care. And thanks again. I really appreciate it. Thank Cheers. You. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Your Family Dog. Got questions? Interesting ideas? Visit www.yourfamilydogpodcast.com to share your thoughts.